Hello, and welcome to Glory Be. Interesting people and how they pray. Each week, we chat with interesting people about their lives, their work, and how they pray. I'm Sharon Hanish. And I'm Mike Malcolm. Our guest today is Peggy Wilmershauser, who worked as a school teacher for 33 years and is currently working as an artist and serving as a pastoral care coordinator here at the Church of St. Mary. She attended the School of St. Mary, graduated from Bishop Kelly High School, and earned a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Oklahoma. Peggy has been involved with Special Olympics for many years because of their daughter, Amy, who is a Special Olympics athlete. She is also committed to ministering to the homeless in Tulsa each Saturday morning. Peggy runs a network of ministries here at the Church of St. Mary, which gives support to caregivers, to those who are grieving, and to those who have miscarried or lost an infant. She has been married to Mark for 51 years, and they have two children and two grandchildren. 51 (laughs) years. That's awesome. We're so excited you're here. Welcome Um, to the podcast. Yes, welcome to the podcast. So so over the course of your life, you've had so so long, (sighs) several different careers. But so talk, how did you... Um, begin why education and uh, you did it you know you did several different things even first grade second grade special anyway talk about that and then also once you retired and and when did the whole art interest artist Mm, I've always loved art but you don't have any time when you teach and the reason I ended up in education was because my very first major declared major at OU was theater And I was going to be a star. And Mm -hmm. um, then you start finding out that in order to fulfill that degree, they expect you to take lighting and um, stagecraft. And I I wasn't interested in any of that. I just wanted to be a star. So it turns (laughs) out, well, I picked education because... There wasn't a foreign language <laughs> requirement. <laughs> and then, and I also thought, well, I could get a job, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that seemed important at 21. Um, but it turns out when you teach and you do a good job, you're reading your audience the entire time and you're <sighs> communicating constantly in a way that keeps them with you. So mm-hmm. it is theater. And so I ended up in theater, just happened to be in front of a classroom. Um, I loved it, loved it. And when I left, it was on a high note. But technology kind of scared me out of the classroom, honestly. They gave me a smart board and said, do something with it. And I thought, I'm doing a 60-hour week already. I don't have time for this. So I thought it was time. So you taught in the Tulsa Public Schools? Always, yeah. And- just you did, was it, did you say first grade? Well, I started in special education preschool, and I loved that. And I did it 16 years, and then I got my master's in early childhood. Um, and then I went to regular first grade and second grade. And second grade is the bomb. It is the most wonderful age for teaching that I can imagine. It was great. I loved it, but I went out on a high note because I was kind of tired And um, I wanted to be an artist, so I took classes through the Parks and Recreation at Waterworks and learned a lot and then just keep doing it. It, I don't do enough of it. I take hiatuses often, but I love it. Do you have have a particular place you like to paint? What do you? My studio. Okay, so... Which used to be my son's bedroom, and by gosh, we cleared it out. <laughs> Do you take pictures and paint from a picture, or what's I, your process? I I have boxes and boxes of photo references, and then it I, I lay them all on the floor. There might be 20 of them, and then something happens on the canvas that goes in a whole different direction, mm-hmm. and it's always surprising and quite a mystery. Now, do you show your art, or do you I used to. I sold art out of Miss Jackson's, and they tore it down, and then I sold art out of the Home Connection Mm -hmm. next door to Saks Fifth Avenue, and they didn't um, renew their lease, and then I 
uh, sold out of a shop on uh, Route 66, and they didn't renew their lease. So I'm the kiss of death for any art <laughs> gallery that I, I just will end your business. So Well, you've donated some great pieces to Mary Fair. I've enjoyed that a lot. That's been fun. Yeah. And large-scale paintings, yeah, too. Yes, so I, I like big. Yeah. Big is fun. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a mindset that you go into that room? Your son's former bedroom, your studio. <laughs> and, oh, usually yeah. I have an idea uh-huh. about what to do, and then it changes fifty times. Okay. So, do you have a favorite piece that you painted? What was it? On? I have several, and the favorites are abstracts, and I often have uh, scriptural references, either. Uh, painted on the side or written privately on the back. I, scripture does <sighs> inform my art. I, mm-hmm. I don't, I, you know, I'll be painting and then all of a sudden I think of a psalm that kind of goes with what's happening here. And so th- it's just surprising. You know, God speaks. Yep. So God speaks through your art as you're creating I would, it. I yeah. would say. Yeah. I would say. You know, so, you've. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask about the creative process. So do you stop and flip open through a Bible trying to find I that do. one song? Well, that's... I have journals yeah. of scripture references, and I flip that. That's the one. That's, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you know, we mentioned in your uh, bio that your family, and I know Mark for sure, I didn't realize that you were also a, bi- uh, a big volunteer with Special Olympics. So talk about that. So you... You started out teaching special ed, and mm-hmm. you have your daughter, mm-hmm. who is a Special Olympics, kind of like a famous Special she Olympics She is. Athlete. She's, been, She's all been all over the world. All over the world. She's won gold medals in China and in Ireland and in South Korea. I what wouldn't let her, her go there now. Yeah. What's what? Her, what is her sport? She does sh- snowshoeing and bocce and speed walking and she just does it all yeah and so gets from lots the of time opportunities she was small when did she start <clears throat> now, getting involved no okay i knew there was something wrong and i was a special education teacher working with preschool children who had language disabilities and so when i saw that things weren't working out as a preschooler i started to raise flags and the doctor just told me I was a nervous mother. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, so uh, I kept watching and listening, and finally, um, she was having seizures also, and you can't ignore that. So finally, we got some help, and she didn't really get tested till second grade. Um, they don't like to test them too early. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, she's been in special education classes uh, throughout her schooling. And, you know, it's kind of like the doctor whose child is sick. You know too much, and it's you're just extremely <sighs> always looking for the next surprise so it won't surprise you, you know. Um, here's what's good news is that it all worked out. She works full time at Reesers. She's got a great life. She has more friends than any of the three of us. <laughs> and she emails people and texts people and is just eager about each day. And if I had, you know, I just, if I'd known that. So I found one day I was at Mass here and there was a couple holding a Down syndrome baby. And after Mass, I grabbed them and I said, listen to me, it's all going to work out. And I told them why I knew. Um, Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, no, we know that. And I thought, oh, they're so far ahead of the game. I did not know that. So, uh, And was Special Olympics something she did from the beginning? No. When when we moved to Union School District, they had a fabulous special education teacher, Monta Ewing, and a fabulous district-wide Special Olympics program. And that's when we got involved in it. So she was in seventh grade. And uh, we didn't really know much about it, but oh my. And so volunteering is as simple as showing up and uh, passing out basketball uniforms and, you know, uh, just 
you know, I helped her write a lot of speeches. She became a global messenger, which is when they ask athletes to speak to groups. And she's spoken to fraternities at TU, and she's spoken to the Chamber of Commerce. And I mean, she spoke, she's spoken to a lot of people. She gave a speech down at Guthrie Green. Mm-hmm. But those speeches have to be written and practiced, and so I consider that a volunteer job. <clears throat> oh, that's so. amazing. And well, you, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I, if you have a question about I do. Special Olympics, well, you go. Well, Special Olympics and also just your heart. I mean, you've got this compassionate, I caring heart. so blessed so with so many you were graces. Born with that, and so and it just keeps on being expressed in I different guess. ways, right? I guess. Well, so you're launching this care network yes. here at this church, and it has kind of three spokes to the wheel right now? I Yes. Um, I'm grieving the loss of my mother. She mm-hmm. died a year ago, mm-hmm. and don't make me cry. <laughs> so I thought, why doesn't our church have a grief ministry? Mm-hmm. And why doesn't our church have a caregiver ministry? Why why are we failing there? And then I heard there was a lady here that was going to start a caregiver mm-hmm. ministry. And so I called her. I said, good you. And she said, oh, no, I'm not going to start it. I am a caregiver, and I've got too much on my plate. And so that's when God said, okay, so, yes. And I, oh, okay. So I, I started that. And grief is... The grief support is starting early November on mm-hmm. the 9th, and it is the most enriching thing to sit at a small table mm-hmm. with people who already have the same faith network going, mm-hmm. so you don't have to apologize for doing the sign of the cross, and we pray together, we do intentions together, and and we tell it like it is, and we get it. Mm-hmm. And nobody has to worry because it's a extremely confidential setting. And uh, what go what they hear stays there. So we've become very good friends. It's it's just a beautiful association. So if people want to become part of, say, the caregivers. Ministry. Show up. Just show up. And, 10 o'clock yep. Wednesday mornings. Mm-hmm. Uh, occasionally we won't have one because of holidays or yeah. something, but otherwise we'll have it all the time. That's great. Mm. Information's on the church calendar, churchsaintmary.com yeah. slash calendar. Good. Plus, then grief ministry launches on November 9th. Yes. And then also we're kicking around the um, support group for miscarriage. I have always had miscar- in my heart how privately the world expects you to handle in the case of the loss of a, a, a of a pregnancy mm-hmm. and i don't understand that if we believe that god enters into that from the moment of conception and i do believe mm-hmm. that then when someone loses a child in utero it is a family death. Mm-hmm. It is a most disturbing l- loss of dreams. And I wish that it was more normalized that people could share their grief for that loss. And so we've fiddled around with trying to have commemorative evenings where people could come and pray together and... uh perhaps tell their story Mm -hmm. around a table because, you know, a lot of people don't want to know about that. Just get on with it. But in fact, that happened to you. Mm -hmm. And all the hormonal changes and all the adjustments of telling the little kids that are already in the family, Mm -hmm. your little brother isn't coming. Um, All that heartbreak. It just, I have not had a miscarriage. I don't know Mm -hmm. that. But it has just come to me that that needs to be addressed and resolved. And so I'm still working on Mm -hmm. developing uh, a way to address that. Well, that's a great gift and a great great gift to the parish, you know. Well, 
Yes, well, it's such a need. I, I agree with you. I remember when my dad died, there was not a grief group, and I wish there was. So I'm just grateful for all that you're doing I'm here. And so blessed to have that opportunity. Well, we're we're so blessed to have you, and and so as we transition to in you know it's glory be interesting people and how they pray. I know prayer is very uh, a very important part of your life mm. and has been for a while. Over the course, you grew up Catholic. Oh yeah, but you've also led retreats. You've been involved with prayer groups through the years. So, how do you pray? How has that changed over the years? Have you always? been a prayer since you were very young nope. talk about your your spiritual prayer <clears throat> went to catholic schools went to ou quit going to mass because you know there's nobody there to take me and um we got married Did we viewed married? ourselves uh, we got married in 71 okay and uh we viewed ourselves as catholics but we didn't go to mass and then you get pregnant and you think wait a minute we meant to do this differently so that's when we went to church went to madeline began to be catholic again and um thank god i it's such a rich uh tradition and such a personal joy to us uh so Birth and children does call you back, call for sure. Back. Well, one of the first things you gave me was a book on gratitude. I don't know if you remember Oh, that. I'll never so forget I, it. It's one of my that, favorite books. Uh, that is a particular way I didn't know I gave that you to did. you. I forgot. <laughs> that, did. that book, it's called 1,000 Gifts, and it'd be so great if I could remember the author's name. Well, Mike can link that. I'll look it up and put it in the show notes. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a woman who had a terrible tragedy as a young child and grew up very bitter about it and learned to recognize God in the moments of her day when a friend challenged her to write down 1,000 things you're grateful for. And she was so angry. That was just her default setting. But as she wrote, day after day, she kept the journal on the kitchen counter or wherever she was, she began to notice things like the rainbows and the soap bubbles when she washed the dishes. It opened her eyes. And so I thought, fine, I'll do that. Oh, my gosh. I have volumes and volumes of gratitude journals. And I don't write in it every day but almost every day and to go back and look five years ago what was I grateful for oh it comes back the joy comes back again so I have all those so I'm what I say to you is that I pray with a pen every single morning I have a different journal that was inspired by the death of Carol Kometz's mother Rosemary Uh, yeah yeah. Ro- okay. Rosalie. Well, Rosalie. Rosalie. Yeah. <clears throat> and she kept a, a journal of what she asked God for. Okay. And I really hadn't done that. So I started doing that. And when you go back and read and realize God came through, mm-hmm. maybe even better than what I asked him how to, you know, help this person get well, help this person get a job, help this... So then now, so now I have my request journal and then I have journals where I write like a scripture that just hits me. And so those are different. I have a lot of paper in my house, (laughs) lots of spiral notebooks and that's how I pray with a pen. I love Mm -hmm. that. Pray with a pen. Yep. Well, it sounds like prayer, you know does come easily most of the time but has there been a time in your life that it's been difficult to pray or do you ever pray angrily with your pen i don't write anger with my pen but during i was interviewed during covid when we were only doing online masses and at first i had this great attitude about how this is just beautiful and i got over it real fast i wanted the eucharist and I couldn't get it, and it ticked me off. So I would take my phone out to the front 
yard and start deadheading bushes <laughs> and listening to Matt. Well, I'm not even going to look at you. I'm just going to deadhead. And then I realized that God was deadheading me. I, you know, you deadhead bushes so that new growth will form. Mm -hmm. And that's what was happening. Um, Praying when Amy was small was tricky because I was so afraid, so afraid of what was coming. Um, And fear is just a horrible thing. And you have to speak it and you have to work it out with God. and, And he... Wants it to go away for you. So being able to talk to other people, getting involved in Special Olympics was a major thing because you find out from people where the good doctors are, how to get the Social Security stuff set up, you know. God just leads you down a path. You just ask him to. That was kind of nice. You know, I know you've led some retreats. How did you get involved with because people ask you to do stuff and you say yes <laughs> well you know you take 24 hours let me think about that and then you realize okay and then it'll all work out and it always does what do you do do you have them write on their retreats do you do have you I done have, like art on a retreat no. or yeah i am a very private artist i don't want anybody watching me uh, mm. because I'm very critical about what gets on the canvas. And so if I know that the person beside me is thinking, what is she think? That is an ugly color. Why would she pick that? I can't deal with that. <laughs> so I'm a very private painter. So, um, but with, with some retreats, I, I definitely have had people write. Um, it's just writing is important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Praying with the pen. Yeah. That's a that's a new one, you know. That's a new people. You know, we've been interviewing a lot of people for a long time, and I'm sure somebody has mentioned a journal before. But well, pray yeah, with but, the pen. Yeah, but that's your favorite way to pray. Favorite. That's your go-to for favorite sure. because mm-hmm. you can always see where God has been mm-hmm. in your life. And that book, One Thousand Gifts, talks about look in the rear view mirror and see how God has gotten you over all those bridges that you see in your rear view mirror and and recognize that he always will. You're his kid. You know, it's grand. Can you look back at your oldest journal? What's your I oldest do. one? I do. Um, I think when my son was in college is okay. when I started that. And, you know, he was away. Yeah. And I, you know, I wrote what I was wishing for, mm-hmm. what I was hoping for in his life. Mm-hmm. We pray for our children every single day, um, and I think they they feel it. So, yeah. Okay, well, Peggy, this has just been this has been great. Great. We we always ask all of our guests if you had one prayer intention that you would like to invite everyone in the world to pray for. What would that be? An end to judgment, an end to evaluating each other and putting each other on ladders of goodness and badness. It's just, I, I wish for all of us to stand on level ground with God leading us onward and not feeling like we know better than the guy standing next to us, you know, um, an end to judgment. And the strife that it causes. I love that. That's yeah. great. We have not had anyone this is request new. prayer for that. An end to judgment. Yeah, we've had, you know, requests for justice and, and certainly peace. Oh, world yeah. peace, for sure. But this is very specific and very different. Um, do I have time? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned the homeless, and so... I pray with the homeless every Saturday morning in a very loosely organized group mm-hmm. that's partly from St. Mary's, partly from St. Bernard's. Mm-hmm. And just last Saturday, I was sitting early in the morning before we went, um, and I just got this 
direction from God to take one of my journals with me. And so when I led prayer with the people, with our street friends and the people that work there, I said, now listen, I have this book, and if you'll just come over to me and tell me your first name and what you want me to pray for for you, I will write your name in my book, and I will pray for you every single day from what you tell me. 20 people came up, and I I couldn't write fast enough. I had to go back later, fix the scribbles. It was really profound. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the things they requested? Well, I also made them tell me something they were thankful for. Mm -hmm. So most of them, well, many of them want shelter Mm -hmm. and safety. And when I asked, "What what are you thankful for? What's God given you? Oh, lessons learned was one lady's answer. Um, Doors that have opened. I have food. I have clothes. I woke up this morning. I I mean, they they think very clearly about those things, Mm -hmm. and I am so overwhelmed with their connection with God, even in those circumstances. It's stunning. Wow. Yeah, lucky me. I get to hear all that. That's what I was thinking. You go out thinking you're the gift to them, you know, kind of like, okay, but they're really the gift to oh, you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's just That's been great. wonderful visiting with you, Peggy. We're I had so fun. grateful that you came on yep. to the podcast. And uh, we, as you know, we're called Glory Be. We close out the podcast. Would you lead us? I would be happy to. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As As it was was in the the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and ever shall shall be, be, world world without without end. end. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Great job, Peggy. Glory Be is a production of the Office of Communications at the Church of St. Mary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm your producer, Mike Malcolm. See you next time.